Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. I'll get this started quick. We probably will run over, so apologies in advance, but if you can't stick through the end, we are recording it, so you can always catch the end uh, if you have to go. But without further ado, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, which is Jason Gilman. He's a 35-year veteran with the public and private sector city planning practice. Um, he served on both the Wisconsin and Minnesota executive boards of the American Planning Association, served the Wisconsin Department of Administration as a grant reviewer for comprehensive planning grants and helped author the state's comprehensive planning guides. He's been involved in numerous public partnerships over his career and is currently the president-elect of APA Wisconsin and the principal of his independent consulting firm, JVG Planning. He will be telling us some stories about his career as it relates to housing, opportunities and challenges of affordability, and what might be next for the U.S. housing shortage. So I will turn it over to you, Jason. All right, thank you, Peter. And it's a, a great pleasure to speak with everybody tonight about this uh, very critical issue that we're dealing with. And uh, I, I must tell you that I don't consider myself- Do you your PowerPoint up there? Uh, or do you want me to throw that up? Sorry. Yeah, if you don't mind, Peter, that would be great. I, 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 I just have a few visuals, but- um, I don't really consider myself an expert on affordable housing. Uh, and while I have fought for mixed density and stratification of price points throughout my career in on housing uh, approvals and reviews, I've also been party to the approval of unaffordable housing subdivisions, which by their very nature are not fiscally sustainable. And the question that always looms is how far does government intervene into private development proposals to positively impact the common good? And uh, that, that is a, a stressor or an issue that staff people have to deal with uh, throughout their career. But my goal this evening is really just to share some stories with you and hopefully that there are stories you haven't heard or they'll empower you with information about housing uh, and we can learn from some of those. And I certainly have. Um, but I'd like to start out with just some of the general threats that we know we face relative to housing affordability. There's obviously supply and demand issues. And when we think about supply, we have materials issues, we have labor issues, and we have uh, existing stock issues uh, because we have an aging population that is uh, staying in their homes longer. And uh, that has changed the, the housing dynamic. We also have wage stagnation, and we know, you know, from data from uh, uh, both uh, think tanks and, and the State Department of Revenue and others that uh, wages uh, have stagnated and they're not keeping up with inflation uh, on uh, things like housing, among other uh, things. And then we have regulation, uh, and regulation can be an impediment to um, relative to zoning and, and that sort of thing. Um, we also, one, one thing that you might not think about or many, many people don't think about is Wisconsin's form of government. And I've, I've always thought that our form of government is one of the larger threats to housing affordability because we have the city, town, village, county uh, construct and, and that creates parochialism and lack of regionalism. And there isn't you know, regional planning relative to housing generally. Uh, we have regional planning commissions, but oftentimes they're serving large rural areas that aren't staffed by professional planners. Um, and uh, that parochialism creates sprawl and, and other things. Uh, so that, that's a, a real serious issue that we have to face. Uh, we also have disinvestment in cities, you know, um, abandon the old urban elementary school and build the new school on the outside of town. And then where do you think the young families are going to migrate to. They want, you know, the best life for their children. So they always go instead of, you know, going to the decaying school or, or the neighborhood without a school where their kids have to be bused, they're going to gravitate to uh, the areas where they're disinvesting in cities. And then we have, you know, the threat of powerful interests that promote sprawl, uh, like road building and, and things that, you know, want to keep spreading out on the landscape. Uh, we have lack of imagination. We have the old paradigm that we can't seem to break out of. You know, why don't we have new models of housing? Uh, and then we have um, our infatuation with parking and site constraints and, you know, what, what it costs to actually develop sites because we oftentimes over design for parking. And then we have uh, um, uh, development costs. So the story coming out of Miami-Dade, this tragic uh, condo collapse, uh, makes me think about, you know, the the whole issue of uh, how much should it cost to construct housing to make sure it's safe. And of course, there's a lot of finger pointing going on and we're gonna find out you know, what when they do the investigation, what actually happened down there. 
Um, but you know, Miami Dade was only certifying these buildings once every 40 years. Uh, it was left to the condo association to make, you know, what was uh, estimated at 15 million in repairs. And uh, that doesn't always work because you have, you know, debate going on while there's a catastrophe looming and you've got to have somebody to make a decisive decision. So uh, anyway, that, that with climate change coming, the, that rolls into um, uh, the issue of development costs, which get built into the bundle that, you know, are part of the development pro forma that creates, you know, what housing actually ends up costing, whether it's a mortgage or, or rent. Um, I want to uh, just mention a few books along the way, too, that uh, you, you might look at, because I've read lots of books over, year, over the years relative to housing issues, and, and I, I kind of reflected on that when I was preparing, and, and uh, some of these are good references. Uh, but in the 1917 book that was uh, um, by John Nolan, uh, entitled City Planning, he noted at the time the characteristic of American towns and cities uh, had been good so far as the subdivision with actual lots built usually between 25 and 40 feet in width with, air, with eight to 10 houses per acre, the standard of an English garden city density. Of course, that was outlawed. Uh, we don't you know, have 25 to 40 foot lots except in the older parts of the city. Uh, now, I think the minimum is 70 or 80 feet in, in many city zoning codes. Uh, so it raises the question, you know, have we over-engineered the city uh, at the expense of density? And then, you know, how does that affect supply and demand? And, and uh, but remnants of the, of the 25 to 40 foot lot are visible everywhere. And not only in old cities in the United States, but in very old cities in, internationally. Um, so another thing that I, I wanted everybody to think about is what is the true cost of housing on society? Because oftentimes it gets minimized to rent or mortgage payments when there's really a lot more to consider. And uh, for instance, uh, Euclidean zoning, which is the, you know, the separation of land use has created the commute and uh, that has created stress on families and then, you know, rushing around with kids to daycare, commuting to your job, you know, having the, co the cost of transportation uh, and so forth. And uh, that's a cost on society. Uh, we also have energy costs and housing decay. So, uh, you know, because we have housing inflation and, and a labor crunch in, in contractors, uh, we have housing that is... Uh, is not being cared for and then you have uh, very poor energy efficiency uh, and sometimes uh, that disproportionately affects the poor because they, they tend to live in those areas that are uh, most decayed where the, the price point is less and then you know they're they're subject to uh, a colder house or an inefficient system among other other issues um, and then there's taxes and the fiscal impact of housing on the city. So I, back in the 1990s, I did a fiscal impact study using, using a sanctioned uh, American Planning Association formula for, you know, what does it cost to serve a house given the lineal feet of space uh, that a house takes up? And I looked at a number of different models, but in general, you know, it was costing the city about a dollar twenty when we were only taking in about a dollar in taxes, uh, and this is of course particularly troublesome because in Wisconsin, the main revenue for cities is property tax, which is arguably somewhat regressive because it doesn't matter if two people live on a block and one person is making twenty five thousand dollars a year in income and one person has a nest egg of $2 million, but they live in the same price house, they're paying the same uh, property tax uh, because it's all based on comps, you know, comp sales or the, si the size of the house. Um, and then there's the wealth and equity creation or lack thereof. Uh, so housing discrimination, when Caroline Gregerson was the housing administrator uh, or, or a community development administrator for the city, they, they did a community needs assessment as part of the HUD uh, work that we are required to do and, and found that uh, there was a great disparity between bank loans to white families and bank loans to black families. And of course, 
if you don't have an, a relationship with a banker and you can't get access to capital to get your foot in the door in the housing market, you can't start building equity. And then that creates a, a long-term effect on your family situation and, and so forth. I would also note that Americans have come to expect a lot compared to citizens of other nations. And this is where I really think the paradigm has to shift. Um, you know, in Costa Rica, a few years ago, I befriended a young man with a family who lived a much different life than we do in a much smaller living accommodation with public transportation, walking and biking, pr his primary um, uh, mode of transportation, fewer material possessions, no need for daycare because he had extended family taking care of the family and low energy costs. And then uh, fast forward, uh, I had a South Korean exchange student stay with me from Seoul for a year back in the 1990s. And when he when he left, uh, I interviewed him and just said, you know, what do you think of the United States? And give me your you know honest impressions. And he said, your houses are huge. And you know that reflected uh, or reminded me that you know we really have a, a, a much different expectation of housing in the United States than they do in many countries along, uh, around the world. So one of the questions that that brought up was, you know, can we, can we change the paradigm on what we consider to be dignified housing? And, and is, it, is it really dignified to build, build homes so large and so spread out and so disconnected from access to basic services that developments are functionally unsustainable over the long term, both economically, environmentally, and perhaps socially. And then what is the future of a custom built mega home once the owners pass on or move? Is it destined to become the converted Victorian boarding house of the past or is the real estate market betting there's always gonna be a market for a four or five, 6,000 square foot home? Uh, that really haunts me because we did so much of that type of building from the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and uh, now, we, now we've got to deal with that. Um, I think there's also been a, a failure of supply side economics, and we have to ask why decades of supply side economic policy has not addressed society's needs and the share of income attributed to housing has steadily risen to the point housing is not attainable for many people. And, uh, and Bill Brockmiller uh, from the Department of Commerce, I believe, uh, indicated in 2019 that La Crosse itself lagged 8% behind the state's average in wage growth. And, uh, and then a recent Brookings report indicated between 1967 and, and 2016, the median growth uh, experienced by prime age Americans over a 15 year period had been cut by almost two thirds from 27% to 8% and the downward mobility of the middle class doubled during that time from 5% to 11%. And here's a few other slides that just show, these are from the Department of Revenue uh, in the state of Wisconsin that kind of show some of that uh, wage data. Um, and, and then meanwhile, inflation's everywhere we look. So we have energy, you know, it takes government mandates to get large power companies to change their paradigm to more efficient systems. Uh, they're continuing to build huge capital projects like these overhead lines, which arguably, you know, pass a lot of future uh, uh, cost onto ratepayers, and uh, and then we have the high cost of transportation, what cars cost these days, and 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 fuel, not to mention time and 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 uh, just the fact that we built cities without close access to things. Housing material and repairs. Now, I did read a story today. I think it was in Fortune magazine that. Uh, lumber prices are coming down fast, but if you really read into the numbers, it's a 27% decline over where it was at its peak, and that's not affordable. I mean, we're still seeing, you know, because of labor and material costs, we're still seeing incredible inflation in, in housing. And then uh, cellular communications, and some people might write that off and say, well, you know, it's a luxury to have a cell phone. Well, I would argue it's not. If you, if you read books like Evicted, uh, you realize how uh, desperately people need communications to get jobs and, and things like that. So it's, uh, um, you know, that, that's a very important service that people need. Uh, healthcare and other health household budget pressures have skyrocketed and we know health is tied to our environment too, which exacerbate, exacerbates the cost for the vulnerable who only have access to poor food choices because we've, you know, consolidated our grocery stores and things like that. Um, and then uh, 
when we think about the cost of unaffordable housing and its broadest definitions, I, I've always liked the uh, book Suburban Nation by Andre Duani, who notes the victims of sprawl, of wasteful urban sprawl, are 80 million Americans who are either too young, too old, too poor to drive, and that suburbia's most helpless victims are those left behind in cities at the bottom tier of our increasingly polarized society where government investment in suburban, suburbia has uh, serving highways primarily has left the urban poor with gra the gradual di disappearance of services and good paying jobs. And, uh, and I saw some of this firsthand in my career uh, while employed in Chicago in the 1980s. There were areas great, of great deterioration in Chicago like Robbins and Cabrini Green. And then uh, even in, in uh, La Crosse, uh, we, we, we've seen, uh, you know, we've mapped using geographic information systems where uh, the areas of greatest disinvestment in are. And, and, uh, and then, uh, the, you know, there's sort of an oppressive uh, uh, history, too, of policy that is not just in uh, our cities, but also uh, how we've treated Native Americans. And I just wanted to mention this quickly because I was invited to speak to the uh, Sisseton Wapaton uh, Nation in Sisseton, uh, South Dakota, uh, about 10 years ago. And I, I was, it was a very, you know, it was an honor to speak uh, with, with the people there. And they uh, gave me a tour and they showed me how the, uh, the families were forced out of their homeland to be housed in this area where there isn't much for economic opportunity and they're housed in federal housing which is price fixed to faraway markets where they, there's little economic opportunity. So even today in places like that, there's oppression going on relative to uh, uh, the people that have um, homes. Um, and then I forced, I, I faced raw discrimination against people of lower wages many times in my career uh, with just nimbyism or not in my backyard, you know, where people uh, in neighborhoods uh, fight to keep out of affordable housing sometimes until they find out they would qualify for it uh, because most affordable housing you have to just meet you know 60 uh, percent or 80 percent of the median household income which a lot of people are in that category and then uh, and then um, a lot of the subsidized housing that I've seen over my 20 year or my uh, 35 years uh, we have to remember too, it only has a 20 year contract. So, you know, beyond that, the repairs are, you know, there's more repairs. Sometimes these buildings get transferred to private uh, entities and then they, they get, uh, the, the rent goes up to market rate and, and so forth. So we have to be cognizant of that. So I think I wanna uh, move on to the positive side, which is really about, uh, you know, what, what are some of the things we could do in the U.S. that uh, can help solve some of the issues we have. And one, one of them is, uh, you know, recognizing that government does have to play a role, that if we, we, we can't let the free market completely control housing because we've seen what that does. It, we, we've seen it in rural areas where there is lack of housing funding or regulation, and there are housing conditions in those areas that most people would not put up within a city where there's density. Uh, we also see it in the older areas, which are you know pre-regulated areas of cities, where you know the there was decay and and uh, uh, and boarding houses, the tenements, of course, of the big cities, and things that forced uh, the politicians' hands to actually create zoning and regulation. So I don't think people are willing to go back to those days where it's just a free market thing. I think, you know, the government has to play a role. So the question is, where does government play the most effective role? And one is, I think, to be genuine about public-private partnerships. That is, engage the developers as real partners and, I, and share risk with them to a certain extent. And I'll get, get into the details of that. And you know, part of it is recognizing housing investment is infrastructure inve investment in the common good because uh, we, the buildings stay with us. You know, the, how, the, the people come and go through the houses, but they stay with us. And, and uh, um, incentivize housing that meets sustainability metrics and 
is a democratic representation of the surrounding labor force's capacity to buy or rent, uh, which avoids gentrification, uh, helps the city long term because it houses the population, it provides workforce housing, it, it creates stability in the market and the tax base and, and so forth. So uh, part of that, uh, part of government's role may also be, you know, a thorough review of regulations with the development community to understand the pros and cons of different regulations without compromising, of course, public safety. We don't, you know, want people uh, to go back to the days of tenements where we had fires and these terrible uh, disasters. Um, but we want market-based solutions that have zoning flexibility. And then the question is, uh, uh, you know, what, how do we share risk? Well, it's a tough proposition with public dollars because we're set up today where the structure of a city attorney and the risk management they have to do usually creates this uh, uh, wedge between the developer and the city. You know, we write a very strict development um, um, uh, contracts that uh, put most of the risk on the developer rather than, than on the city. So where can the city assume some risk? I would say that they can assume some risk in uh, taking on uh, some of the risk of new energy technologies like uh, research and development on, you know, trying to get to zero energy development. So that might be an area of public investment. Uh, we might take on some of the risk of dealing with the uh, uh, old redevelopment sites like unclassified excavation, pollution, you know, things that are uh, environmental requirements, fire codes, uh, and uh, and that sort of thing. Maybe new technologies and building sprinkler or, or fire suppression systems would be one that would allow uh, us more density and, and then maybe the, the fire um, professionals would, would rest at ease that you know uh, density is not gonna result in uh, the types of fires that we saw in the 19th century, you know, where they spread from house to house to house. Um, and then I would say, you know, re removing some of the zoning impediments and parking is one of those things that uh, is an unfortunate place. Every conversation seems to end up, but how can a well-intended developer that is trying to attract a carless market, not push cars onto the street, which annoys neighbors and other landlords. And then, you know, not, not only initially, but well into the future. And then who bears that risk? And I, I think I've always thought that one of the solutions to that is unbundling the parking costs so that if a, a renter decides that they have to have a car, they're going to know the cost of that, the full cost of it. It's not just Im embedded in the rent. And then, of course, unbundling the cost of parking can also uh, be coupled with things like residential permitting and other things that keeps, you know, that uh, parking resource uh, with the people that are actually paying for it. I would say we also need to revamp single use zoning, uh, more flexibility given certain conditions. And uh, we of course did that when I was the planning director with the zoning overlay district at Bridgeview Plaza. Uh, I think we have to uh, recondition the public on, you know, uh, to get rid of nimbyism and, you know, through education and model projects. And maybe this requires a public information officer or more, more of a concerted public relations type effort uh, so that people understand what it means to have density in their neighborhood, that it's not a, a horrific threat like uh, sometimes it's made out to be. And then our approach to rehab materials, re, re, reuse, uh, mega home conversions, which we may see in the future, and you know uh, what happens to that, the future housing stock, those mega homes that we've seen in the past. Um, and then a few redevelopment options uh, that I just want to mention. Um, so I'm just going to check my time really quick here. Um, one, one concept that uh, we talked about in the, uh, I've got about six minutes uh, before I'll, I'll end, uh, but one concept we talked about uh, pretty seriously in the planning office when I was there was the idea of what's called a corner grouping. And that is where you take a block of property, let, let's say it's like in the floodplain and the homes are uh, functionally uh, no longer uh, serviceable because of insurance costs and you know the high groundwater and the decay that is being brought about by FEMA policies that don't allow massive you know investment in these older homes that are in the floodplain. Uh, 
a developer goes in and tries to acquire a block of let's say 10 or 12 homes and they're faced with uh, people negotiating every single house and undoubtedly you know what usually happens is they get toward the end of that acquisition and and the price starts going up because somebody's trying to get more and more and more money from the developer well in order for the developer to make the pro forma work they have to build in density and if they only get the original 10 houses that the block uh, commanded or had at the time of acquisition they can't make the numbers work because somebody's asking for double the price uh, of, of the home uh, and this is where the corner grouping comes in. So what cities can do is they can uh, revamp the regulations to allow a density bonus if the developer redevelops the entire block. So let's say they get to that last home or two that they're gonna acquire and it costs them 150% of market, but because they got the entire block now on that corner, uh, maybe close to services or a transit stop, they can actually put up a, a six unit building or a four unit building, <coughs> excuse me, obviously designed, uh, you know, with the integrity of the neighborhood in mind, uh, not cheap construction, but, you know, um, that can be built into the performance standards of the zoning code. But that type of a corner grouping redevelopment uh, starts to create uh, more supply and the beauty of it is, is it leverages existing infrastructure and investment and services. So we're not sprawling, you know, we're not building big apartment buildings way out on Highway 35. Uh, we're, we're putting them right in the city, leveraging existing infrastructure, uh, which creates a, a better, you know, a virtuous cycle of uh, funding for the city and then uh, service delivery because we've got more people um, requiring services. So, uh, the, the other one I wanted to mention was the um, uh, uh, Minneapolis example of where they use tax incremental financing to infuse, uh, to, to basically incentivize a high density development along corridors where the light rail was. And what that does, of course, is it creates uh, that virtuous cycle of more consumers using transit, paying more fares, and then because the, the, the uh, transit is taking in more money, they can increase their service, which makes it more convenient, which brings in more fares, and it just keeps uh, building on itself. And we have a great opportunity in La Crosse to do that with US 53, uh, the corridor study that was done uh, uh, in the city. And if you, if you re-envision a corridor like US 53 or uh, you know from downtown out to exit three, uh, and think about the way it is today, and then think about it with neighborhood centers divided by higher density housing, uh, attractive housing that is walkable to these neighborhood centers where there are services, but also fuels a very robust transit system. It's a much different picture than the very diluted and, and kind of a mushy uh, mix of land uses we have along that corridor today. Uh, and to make that even more appealing, uh, we can take advantage of these uh, vacated big box retail sites that were very auto centric, but now they, they can serve the purpose of uh, infusing a corridor like that with housing and neighborhood centers uh, to create that type of uh, environment. Uh, another one that we, we looked into was land trusts and uh, land trusts, of course, is where, where you create a, you know, a geographic area that is uh, owned by the trust and then you sell off the housing uh, and it's only the housing that gets transferred. So it takes the land inflation out of the mix and it keeps the housing more affordable long-term. Uh, cities have been a little bit gun shy about land trusts because uh, central cities that bear the burden of all the nonprofits and services and things like that are always looking to preserve tax base. And when you have a land trust owning land, you, you remove the taxable portion, you know, the land portion of that uh, development. But there could be ways around that. And I, I think that's something worth looking into to hedge against gentrification and try to preserve affordability in the central city. And uh, the new director, Andrea Train, and I talked about that uh, years ago uh, relative to, you know, redevelopment areas in the center uh, part of the city where the Opportunity Zone program is and, and so forth. 
Um, but Douglas Farr's book, Sustainable Urbanism, suggests mixed income TODs or transit oriented developments present an opportunity to meaningfully address the nation's growing affordability crisis and uh, address the intractable problems of worsening congestion, which we seem to just keep fueling that and uh, the rising unaffordability that comes with that and then the growing gap between lower income and wealthier individuals uh, because it, it, you know, TODs allow more access to opportunities. Um, so one last thing I wanted to mention about uh, the current data. Um, I was at a, a WIDA conference that Caroline Gregerson asked me to go to a few years ago and they had a panel uh, and I, um, and the panel uh, was made up of developers, builders, and I think some WIDA uh, representatives. And, and uh, excuse me, my, I just wanted to make sure I was timing myself. Um, the panel said that when they studied uh, the cost of a 40 unit apartment building in 2013, and then the same construction of the 40 unit apartment building in 2016, they saw a 42% increase in costs. And, uh, the Federal Reserve in a 2019 report uh, in the, uh, the National House Price Index said that uh, during that similar period that uh, there was more than 50% uh, uh, inflation in housing costs above level seven years earlier, which corresponded to an average rate of increase of about 6% a year. And then meanwhile, the per capita per personal income only increased at uh, um, 25% or 3.3% over those same seven years. So there, you know, so the, this panel was asked, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to, how are you going to meet Madison's housing needs if the inflation is way beyond personal income uh, or wage growth? And they said, well, we're not going to compromise on quality because developers, when they invest and they have a pro forma, you know, they have a certain expectation of building longevity and we, we can't do that. Not only can we not do it economically for the developer's interest, but we can't do it to the city. And so they decided they were gonna just make the units smaller, uh, but more cleverly designed and, and you know, more common areas and things like that. And we're starting to see some of those solutions come out, but it gets back to the issue of, you know, how do we define dignified housing? And do we have to have, you know, thousand square feet, 1200 square feet, et cetera. I grew up in a 600 square foot 1960s ranch house with four people in it, which equates to about 150 square feet per individual or 12 by 12 per individual. Um, for some reason, we've gotten away from that. And I think we're going to have to redefine what dignified housing is for people uh, if we want to get back to affordability. So those are my comments for tonight. I, I, uh, I hope it was helpful. I hope I shed some light on a few things for, for people. Um, and uh, I enjoy, uh, um, looking forward to enjoying the rest of the program. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, so we'll move on. Next up is Ashley Lesensky. She is the Community Development Director with Cap, and she actually oversees the land trust that we currently have in La Crosse. So she can dig into that a bit for us. Take it away. Um, do you, are you sharing this or do you want uh, me? Whatever's to... easier for you. Um, it doesn't matter. I can. You could just share a screen then. Okay. Okay. Um, so Cooley Cap currently has a, a community land trust. Uh, we refer to it as the Cooley Community Land Trust. Um, just a little bit of a disclaimer. I didn't have a ton of time um, tonight and it is a pretty in-depth and complex complex process. So I'm really trying to just kind of keep it really high level for everybody um, and just kind of to get you understand, just to understand lightly um, what a community land trust is and things like that. So I am available for questions and things like that um, after as well. Um, but currently, so like I said, Cooley Cap started a land trust. Uh, there is land trust in Madison. Um, there's also a pretty large land trust um, in Rochester that was started by Mayo Clinic as a way to help with um, the affordability that they were facing for their employees um, at the health center. Um, and there's also others in the state that have been talking about starting land trusts. Um, I know that there's been uh, quite significant conversations kind of coming from, I think the Door County and Milwaukee areas about starting a land trust as well. 
Um, and so um, it's a way for us to create permanently affordable housing. And right now there are about 225 um, land trusts in the United States. Sorry, Ashley, you didn't go to presentation mode, someone mentioned. Oh. Wanna... Yes. Are we good? Okay. Jesus, how? All right. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Community land trusts, or CLTs, are nonprofit organizations that acquire, own, and steward land permanently for the common good. The most common CLT land use is housing, but retail, office, and a variety of other uses are possible. CLTs give formal decision-making voice and power to local community residents in determining land uses. Here's how CLTs make home buying affordable for families in their communities. First, the CLT builds or buys homes using one-time public or private investment. Next, the CLT sells just the home to a low-income buyer who qualifies for a mortgage. And the CLT keeps the land, holding it in trust for future generations of home buyers. In return for being able to buy a home at a discounted price, the family agrees to pay it forward and sell to another low-income family at a price they can afford. The CLT manages the sales process, ensuring that each home buying family builds some wealth from a predetermined, limited amount of the sales proceeds. In this way, the one-time public or private investment in CLT homes makes lasting affordability a reality and stabilizes communities. And CLTs benefit the larger community too, as they preserve and protect housing for long-term residents, helping to build stronger, safer, and higher quality diverse neighborhoods, contributing to greater educational attainment employment opportunities, and health outcomes. Visit GroundedSolutions.org to learn more about CLTs today. So that's just a, um, a kind of a video I found from the National Community Land Trust Network that I feel like does a pretty decent job of just trying to explain the land trust at a pretty high level. Um, in the video, it talks about the initial subsidy that's provided to make the home affordable that will always stay with the house. Um, that is really kind of what helps make this housing permanently affordable. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well, but just a little bit of a background. So we started the land trust at Cooley Cap in November of 2009. Um, currently, there are 22 homes in the land trust. Um, and We've only had two resales over the last 11 years. And what a resale is, is basically when a family that's currently in a land trust house um, chooses to sell their home and move out into a new home. Um, and so from what I've been told by um, some of our support providers um, through the land trust um, network and things is that that's pretty uncommon. Um, the lady that helps us with our software to kind of manage our transactions and stuff, like she says, it's pr practically unheard of. So kind of the one thing that we are experiencing is even, it's a way for us to create permanently affordable housing, but it's not necessarily serving as that transition housing as it maybe should um, kind of serve as. Uh, land trust homes really are almost kind of a, like they're best used as a stepping stone um, from rental to like traditional fee simple home ownership, which is how um, the majority of, of households probably own their homes. Um, and so uh, the land trust, we haven't added a new home in, in many years. Um, it's probably been five or six years or so. Um, and that's really, at this point, it's just been a funding issue. We haven't had money that we've been able to grow and expand um, this area of Cooley Cap in a while. And so kind of, um, and Jason talked about it a little bit as well, um, is so with a land trust property, someone buys the improvements only. So they're buying the house and the land itself stays with the land trust. And so um, what ties those two items together is called a ground lease. And it's a, the legal contract for long-term affordability. Um, it really outlines what each party's responsibilities are within the relationship. Um, while there's still a lease involved, it's not like renting. It really gives you the uh, benefits of home ownership. Um, there's tax benefits. You're able to paint your home. Um, you can landscape, plant a garden, um, use your property as you want. Um, it's really there to help you build equity, but this is just kind of the ground lease itself is, is what outlines everything between the land trust itself and the homeowner. Um, as the land trust staff um, ourselves. We're not like intervening and monitoring like a landlord. Um, it's really the homeowner's asset and um, they are expected to take care of it. 
there are some things um, um, that are involved in the land trust, which kind of help us establish uh, a replacement reserve account, which basically if someone were to um, be in a position where they were unable to make repairs or something like that for the land trust home, um, we can potentially access some of those funds to help them with those repairs and things. Um, and so that's kind of a built-in kind of protection. It's very similar to like the um, condo associations and the um, the reserve accounts that they have to do maintenance and things on those. Um, and the ground lease is 98 years and it can be renewed and inherited. Um, and so what kind of dictates how a land can trust- Can I say really quick? You've got a yep. little, that captions blurb blacking out the last few words on your slide. Um, you see that on your screen? No. I don't, I've oh, lost okay. it to you That's guys okay. too, yeah. so. <laughs> we can see almost everything, so. Okay. Um, and so the ground lease formula is really what determines how um, the, or what sets the sales price for the next buyer. Um, land trust, uh, property owners, realtors, um, appraisers, or I should, excuse me, not appraisers, but like realtors and owners and other parties don't set up the purchase price for their own property. Um, the purchase prices are all dictated by the ground lease. And so the owner will get 30% of the appreciated value of the improvements. So that's just the change in market value. Um, and appraisals are used to determine um, that value for the property. So when someone purchases a home, um, they get an appraisal of the property that helps determine its value. And then when they're ready to sell, a second appraisal is ordered. And that's what determines, that's what helps determine um, the current value of the property to determine how much the home will be sold for. Um, the home is always gonna be sold at a lower price to the next buyer. And this happens every time the house is sold. And so um, I do have uh, like a actual financial example, which I think kind of really ties this in um, the best way possible. So this is an actual example of one of our resales. And so when the first family bought the house, um, the appraised value of the home was $118,000. We provided $23,000 in down payment grants. So that's part of that initial subsidy that helps make the home permanently affordable. So with those that $23,000 in grants, the buyers had to take out a $95,000 mortgage loan. And um, so that's the amount that they've been paying to the bank. Uh, when they went to sell the property, it appraised at $152,000. So in that seven years that they owned the property, the appraised value went up $30, $34,000. So they got to keep 30% of that or $10,200. So then we take that equity share that they got to take away and we add that to their initial sales price of $95,000. And this house that is now valued at, or that's now valued at $152,000 is being sold to a new buyer for $105,200. In addition to all of the equity, they still get to keep everything they've paid. So um, if they've paid off 10, 15, $20,000 on their mortgage to their bank, they get to keep that as well. So none of that is included in this land trust example. It's really all about the appraisal for the properties. And so a $105,000 house is potentially significantly more affordable for a lower income family than $105,000. And kind of how this is a little bit different than some of our traditional programs, like so Cap, we will build and develop new homes and we'll sell them. Um, the City of La Crosse has their replacement housing program, which all provide down payment assistance to help make the homes affordable. But so, you know, in an example, if someone's given uh, $50,000 for down payment, the home will be affordable for that very first buyer because their payment will be lower. Um, then when they sell the house, they repay that $50,000 and that money gets put into a new project. But that house is no longer affordable because that subsidy is gone. The home is now being sold for true market value. And so that's kind of really the difference between these, like the, you know, kind of traditional down payment assistance programs that we're used to offering um, and the land trust example is it retains that permanent affordability piece of it. 
Um, and we've structured some of these so that um, we've had first mortgages as low as like $50,000 um, for some of these families to really serve families that are like 30% county median income and under. Um, I think we only did one or two homes in that price point because we need a lot of upfront cash and subsidy to provide grants to uh, make the first mortgage that affordable. Um, but there are several homes that are in a pretty um, low price point for buyers. So, and I think that is all that I have on that for now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for filling us in more on that project that we have going on. Uh, we'll just keep rolling. Next up is going to be Kevin. He is presenting. He is a member of Cooley Tenants United, um, local historian, and uh, I believe leading expert in grocery stores in the lacrosse area, although I don't know if that's super relevant, but I didn't ask him for his introduction, so I, that's what I'm going with. Uh, sure. I mean, that is true. Um, let's see. So... Oh, Ashley, you got to stop sharing before oh, Kevin I, started. I got it here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you see mine? Yes, we got you. Okay, great. Um, so last week we heard about uh, a lot about homelessness in the Cooley region, um, and a lot of um, a lot of homelessness um, issues and solutions um, are focused on how do we uh, how do we subsidize landlords? How do we incentivize landlords to uh, accept um, people who are currently unhoused? Um, I'm going to uh, take this discussion to a completely other level. I'm not going to provide as much in the way of technical insights like Jason or Ashley. Um, this is going to be more of a big picture look um, about alternatives to the landlord system. Uh, so what's the problem with landlords? This is quite a lot. Uh, landlords often refuse Section 8 and other voucher programs, uh, even with financial assurances. Um, this is not due to financial worries, but discrimination against recipients of public welfare, and that's just um, uh, what we've seen for years. Um, landlords frequently reject renters due to past homelessness, bad credit, evictions on record, or felonies, um, and this leaves many of our community uh, members uh, without much in the way of options. Uh, and landlords are often, oh, there we go, uh, I have to get my thing out of the way here. Landlords are often abusive of desperate tenants. Um, and when tenants don't really have a lot of other places they can go, um, landlords are neglectful um, and very mean <laughs> uh, to tenants, um, especially neglect. Uh, two, uh, landlords often defer maintenance. Uh, they make money. They make more money by providing the minimum. Uh, if uh, if I have the option of doing a thousand dollars in repairs or not doing a thousand dollars in repairs, and instead of keeping the money more profitable to keep the money. Um, landlords have no incentive to do weatherization because tenants pay the heating bills. And in addition to higher heating bills for tenants, this is a climate catastrophe. Weatherization is critical to meeting our carbon reduction goals. Um, and that's because the tenants pay the heating bills, but the landlords pay for improvements, right? So why would a landlord pay for improvements when they don't see any of the, um, any of the payback from it? Um, landlords are essentially dictators uh, and are often the product of inheritance, which is which is anti-democratic. They're dictators. Anybody who, who rents <laughs> knows that um, negotiating for a lease is not a negotiation. It's just here's the lease. Um, and uh, um, inheritance, uh, like that's um, that's not meritocratic, right? Uh, that's not that's that's not capitalist, um, but in the bad way. Um, we, we don't have a hereditary aristocracy in this country for good reason, um, but our landlords are rapidly turning into a hereditary aristocracy. Um, despite all of the things I just said, uh, there are no really, truly bad landlords. I don't blame landlords as individuals for things that they do. Uh, there's also no good landlords. And this is because landlords are a product of a broken system. Uh, they are carrying out their function based on incentives and legal structures. Uh, for example, market rate rent prices result from supply and demand, which is beyond the landlord's control. If a landlord see, looks around and sees everyone else is charging $700, you'd be a fool not to raise your rent to $700, right? Um, speaking of which, uh, so going on with the market rate rent and the problem there, $700 for one bedroom is absurd. It's unaffordable, as we heard last week. Um, we need to start targeting 
something more like $400 is something that is much more affordable, uh, but the market can't or won't deliver that price based on supply and demand. Um, and so these, these broken systems are leading to skyrocketing rent and have shifted renting from a customer seller relationship to a boss employee power dynamic. Renters fear their landlords in the same way that an employee fears the boss. Um, so the way to combat a broken system is with better systems. Um, okay, now I'm going to share a video. Uh, let's see if I can do this without breaking everything. Okay, can you see this video? It's, it's a big blue and purple screen. Actually, okay, great. So I can get this work. You can hear this? Yes. Okay, great. So what do you think? American housing is in crisis. Right now, up to 12 million Americans are behind an average of $5,800 on rent and risk eviction. With eviction moratoriums soon to expire, we're facing an unprecedented wave of evictions and foreclosures that will crash straight into millions of struggling families across the country. But the truth is, this crisis didn't begin with the pandemic. In fact, housing has been in crisis for a very long time. Even before the pandemic, in places like New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco, median rents for even one-bedroom apartments could approach $2,500 a month or more. About a third of people in Los Angeles spend a majority of their income on housing. In New York City, about 20% of all renters pay most of their income to their landlord. And in my district, Astoria, about a quarter of residents have to spend most of their paycheck on rent. And the crisis isn't just in big cities. In 95% of all U.S. counties, workers making the minimum don't make enough to afford a one-bedroom rental on their own. The Harvard Center for Housing Studies warns of a new normal for housing in the United States, in which nearly half of all renter households spend almost a third of their income on rent. That's why even before the fallout from the coronavirus started to hit, more than half a million Americans nationwide were already homeless, millions more on the brink of losing their housing, and countless families struggling every month to make ends meet. At the root of all of this suffering is the fact that in this country, housing is treated as a commodity, not a right. It's a consumer product, just like clothes or cars, that private businesses can sell on the market to make a profit. And if someone isn't able to pay, either because their landlord raised their rent or because they can't work for one reason or another, they're not able to stay in their homes. If they're lucky, they can live with friends or family or maybe in transitional housing for a bit. But for a lot of people, they have nowhere else to go and they end up sleeping on the streets. In December 2019, the number of people sleeping in homeless shelters in New York reached 19,000 people, an all-time high. 100,000 New York City students are homeless. That's more than 10% of the entire student population. Why do so many people end up homeless? It's not because there aren't enough homes to go around. There are plenty of empty homes. No, it's because housing people is not the primary goal of developers or landlords. Their goal, simply put, is to make a profit. And it's much more profitable to build luxury apartments for the rich than decent homes for the poor. This gives us a big shortage of homes for ordinary working people. For every 100 households that are extremely low income, there are only 36 affordable and available homes. As a result, we have plenty of housing for the rich, but poor and working class people don't have nearly enough on the market. So we have people scrounging to make ends meet or sleeping on the streets right below luxury condos and uninhabited apartments. This is a terrible way to organize a housing market. It might be profitable for landlords and developers, but it's not efficient or beneficial for the rest of society. In fact, housing doesn't have to be seen as a market at all. In other countries, housing is considered a fundamental right, like education or healthcare. That means the government goes to significant lengths to guarantee everyone has a home, and the market plays a much smaller role in the construction and distribution of housing. So let's hop across the pond and about 100 years back in time to take a look at just one example of how an alternative housing model got started in beautiful red Vienna. At the end of the First World War, the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed, leaving behind a number of successor states, including modern-day Austria, home to the former imperial capital of Vienna, the fifth largest city in the world. Despite being the seat of an empire, the chaos of the war and decades of neglect had left the working class of Vienna in desperate circumstances. Inflation was rampant, jobs were scarce, social services were non-existent, and hundreds of thousands of people were crammed into decaying tenements where overcrowding, disease, and violence were rampant. 
So it's no surprise that in 1919, at the first elections ever held in Austria where all adult citizens could vote, the Social Democratic Party swept into power at the municipal level on the promise of dramatic social and economic reform. And they delivered. The new government of Vienna implemented a huge range of services, including public health care and public child care. They built high-quality hospitals, schools, and recreational facilities. But their crowning achievement was an ambitious program of social housing, what Americans call public housing, that began in 1923 and saw 60,000 new apartments constructed in the first year of its existence, built by the government and financed by taxes on the rich. But these weren't the kinds of apartments you might picture when you think of public housing in the United States. Drab, high-rises, plagued by chronic neglect and underinvestment. Residents could enjoy leafy courtyards, wide open spaces, and plenty of natural light. They had shared laundries, state-of-the-art kitchens, food co-ops, bathhouses, pharmacies, lecture halls, schools, and swimming pools. These apartments were designed to be both beautiful to look at and beautiful to live in, fostering a sense of shared community among the people who lived there. And the best part was that because the city didn't have to worry about making a profit, just about paying off their maintenance costs, these homes were both much nicer and much cheaper than what workers had previously known. In 1926, the average rent in Viennese social housing was about just 4% of a monthly wage. The first 15 years after Austrian independence saw its capital transform from a symbol of urban blight into a beacon of socialist governance. It became known as Red Vienna, after the official color of the socialists who had pioneered these changes. And even though Red Vienna fell in 1934 when the country was seized by fascists, who did what they could to roll back social housing, that commitment to good, cheap housing remained after the Second World War. Today, an astonishing 62% of all city residents live in social housing, with the average monthly rent falling somewhere between $400 and $600 a month, with subsidies for lower income tenants. That is a fraction of what people in America pay. Unlike in the United States, where public housing is treated as a worst case way to house the very poor, Vienna's social housing residents are extremely diverse. Everyone except the top fifth of the population is eligible to live in social housing. This means there's broad appeal across many segments of society, which creates the foundation for its political popularity. That is how the majority of people in Vienna enjoy something that's considered almost utopian here in New York affordable housing that isn't just cheap, but desirable. Housing that isn't just four walls and a roof, but a real home with a sense of stability, safety, and community built in. Now, of course, this is only one example of an alternative framework for housing. And Vienna has not fully removed housing from the domain of the market. Residents still pay part of their earnings and rent to cover operational costs, and a sizable chunk of the population lives in private housing but it's an actually existing alternative that shows us what a step toward a better world could look like. If we want to end the housing crisis, the solution has to be moving toward the full decommodification of housing. In other words, moving away from the status quo in which most people access housing by purchasing it on the market and toward a future where we guarantee high quality housing to all as a human right. So how can we do it? We can start by making sure people who access housing on the private market have ironclad protections against abuse and exploitation. But to go further, toward the Vienna model, we'll have to go beyond the market. We can establish community land trusts to gradually buy up housing on the private market and convert it to community ownership. We can give tenants a right of first refusal to buy out their landlords when buildings go up for sale. And we can fully commit to a new era of social housing, ending subsidies for luxury housing development and using our wealth to build beautiful, high-quality social housing projects that offer good homes and strong communities to everyone. We won't decommodify housing overnight, but we know what we have to do, and we have history to guide us. And we know how we'll get there, through a movement of the multiracial working class organizing for the better world we know is possible. And we've already begun. I'm Zahran Mamdani, Assemblyman for New York's 36th Assembly District in Astoria, Queens, for the Grubel Institute. Okay, are we back to the moving away from market-based housing? Is that what we're looking at? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show that video because it said uh, a lot of things I was going to say, but with way higher production value uh, and an actual script. Um, so the main thing I want to, that I wanted to show that video for was this idea of um, of non-market housing, decommodified housing, uh, alternatives to the landlord system. So now real quick, I'm just gonna go over a couple of, of um, the sort of, the more mainstream alternatives to the landlord system that have been uh, developed across the country and the world. 
um, just to give a real brief overview, just to let you know what is out there, basically. Um, so public housing, um, a lot of people are familiar with that already. Uh, a government agency is the landlord. Um, usually it's, uh, it's just for, uh, it's subsidized and it's just for, quote, eligible low-income families, the elderly and persons with disabilities. That's from, that's language from HUD. Um, and there's a negative public perception. Um, Pruitt Ego and Cabrini Green are sort of these classic examples that are almost this trauma <laughs> in the public's mind. When you say public housing, they're say, oh, Cabrini Green, and then it's off the table. Um, and public housing is, um, is, is not for everyone, right? It's only for a, a small number of people. There's a lot of stigma associated with public housing. Uh, community land trust, as Ashley talked about, a nonprofit or government agency owns the land and leases it to the building owner. Um, this allows uh, permanent community um, ownership uh, and, and stipulations on what sorts of buildings uh, can be built on the land. If you wanna keep it low income, for example. Uh, housing cooperatives are something that hasn't been talked about yet. Um, with a housing cooperative, uh, the tenants are their own landlords. Uh, so um, if you're a tenant there, you are a part owner of the, of the building or the property. Um, wide variety of possibilities for how cooperatives can work. Um, sometimes they resemble condos. You see a lot of these in New York City um, where basically you just buy your apartment in the co-op. Um, so it's basically a condo. Uh, sometimes they're uh, directly democratic anarchist hippie communes. Madison um, has a lot of these. Um, and uh, so um, tenants can keep their rent affordable and respond to their own maintenance. Um, you're not going to evict yourself, right? You're going to avoid evicting your neighbors because if you have this sort of community, they're often going to be, you're going to know them better. They're going to be your friends. Um, you're not going to price yourself out of your own home. Uh, there's less profit incentive because any profit that would be generated is generated off of you. So it's like taking money out of your right pocket and putting it in your left pocket. <laughs> um, and uh, you can respond to your own maintenance faster um, if the tenants have their own uh, property manager that's someone they hire, right? So the property manager is gonna be responsive. Uh, the downside with cooperatives is that they require more attention from tenants. Uh, democracy is a lot of work as I hope we all know. Um, and um, so for example, the, um, the co-ops in Madison have frequent uh, meetings. They have contested uh, elections to the board. Um, and that can be a good thing if you like democracy. It can be a bad thing if you just want a place to live and you don't care about any of that. So give and takes, it's something I think that we need a lot more of. Um, and social housing, as the video explained, uh, public housing, but for everyone. Uh, with the one thing the video didn't touch on is the idea of income-based rent. So let's say that you have the rent be 20% of your income. So if you make $3,000 a month, your rent is $600 a month. Um, if you make $10,000 a month, then your rent is $2,000 a month, which is obviously very expensive for lacrosse. But if your rent is $500 a month, then, sorry, if, you, uh, if your income is $500 a month, your rent is $100 a month. And um, by putting everyone in the same kind of housing, regardless of your income, you take away a lot of the social stigma um, and you let people, and by making it percentage-based rather than um, bracketed and a lot of, um, uh, government subsidies for housing and for housing and so forth. Uh, it's bracketed, so if you make more money, you might price yourself out of your subsidy. But by making it um, a percentage of your income based, then your rent simply slides up as your income goes up. So you're not penalized for making more money. Um, yeah. So those are just some of the alternatives I wanted to uh, get out into the into the public mind. Um, and where I think we need to go with this, I think we need a, a transformative new model for lacrosse housing. Um, we cannot solve the housing crisis, transportation crisis, or food deserts without addressing the other two. Uh, housing, transportation, and food systems are the same problem. They're just, they're, it's one problem. Um, La Crosse's population density before World War II was three times what it is today. During that era, we had corner grocery stores and a trolley-based mass transit system. Suburbanization has been a catastrophe for La Crosse both within the city limits and now the suburbanization uh, to surrounding communities. Um, every parking lot is a policy failure uh, and we need to be thinking of new housing in terms of high quality five to nine story buildings under tenants control. That's um, aspirational obviously, but I would like to see that as uh, a sort of mindset for us to aspire to. 
Uh, we have an opportunity to build an affordable democratic housing system for everyone, uh, but it's going to be it's going to require leadership and action from local government and NGOs. Um, that's it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And um, I am actually next, so I will just get my presentation up here. Everybody, see this? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I did just want to, I wanted to touch on what Kevin said about social housing and public housing in La Crosse. Um, just to point out that we do already have some properties owned by the county in the city. I think we do lean heavily on public private partnership for some things, but as, as that video points out, um, if we don't remove the market force, we really can't get rents down. And so the county does own um, Hillview Healthcare Center and Ravenwood Behavioral Health. Those are both um, nursing homes. So they are targeted towards a specific population, but the the county is in effect in the role of a landlord there. Um, and then the city does buy and own houses. Uh, typically it's to tear them down or to really completely remodel them and then sell them back. But uh, because of HUD rules, they actually have to keep tenants in those homes as long as the tenant is going to stay. And so the city is already also uh, in the landlord market, uh, so to speak. And so there's really, from, from our research, there's nothing that stands in the way of um, housing being owned or built owned and operated by the city or the county or, or both. And then of course the housing authority, um, you know, owns and operates the public housing as we know it currently. So there, there are a lot of opportunities to build more, but uh, you know, looking at one more solution for how we can get more affordable housing is trying to get the section eight program expanded. Um, as Kevin mentioned, people do discriminate against section eight tenants. It was also mentioned in our program on Monday, if you go back and listen to that. Um, and you know, there's, there's not good reason, but it is a logical decision. Unfortunately, as Kevin stated, La Crosse has a really low vacancy rate. You can see we're at about 3.5 versus the national vacancy rate uh, around six and a half to seven, which means uh, you know it's a landlord's market. There's a lot of tenants lined up for units and not a lot of units to house them in at the moment. And so they can be really discriminating. Um, they can be really careful with who they want to accept. And um, you know, Section Eight is is just a great program because takes a big burden off of our local tax base. It's coming in from the federal government, so we don't have to raise that money. You know, we, we do have a, a zero sum game as far as what we can build with our local tax base. So, um, you know, the idea of the mitigation fund it actually has been proposed in La Crosse and it has had a pilot program. And essentially um, you would take a sum of money and set it aside for uh, any excessive damages beyond the typical security deposit and ask landlords, you know, to take section eight, knowing that there is extra funds available up to some amount to cover any possible damages or any other catastrophe. And you know, the great thing about a program like that is the money doesn't really fly out of the bank account because Section 8 housing users are just normal people who really need some help getting their life back on track typically. So um, it's really, it's a, an effective use of funds to really multiply our dollars uh, because we're spending them to bring more dollars in from the HUD department and from federal tax base. Uh, it really is an excellent program. Um, you know, the one downside is you need to have you know, some capital lying around to, to use for that damage mitigation. But fortunately, you know, we do have this huge stimulus coming through and it is an opportunity to fund programs like that. So, uh, and I didn't introduce myself, sorry. My name is Peter. I am the chair of Cooley Tenants United. Uh, so what is Cooley Tenants United? We are uh, a tenant advocacy and organizing group. We started in late 2019. Our mission is to educate, empower and organize tenants. Um, being a tenant is really challenging. Um, there's a lot of responsibility placed on tenants and um, a lot less placed on landlords than I think we would like to see. And uh, there really isn't a ton as far as resources in understanding all of that. So um, I can't remember where I saw this, but I saw it in another presentation and it really stuck out to me. Um, municipal housing regulations rely on tenant enforcement to function effectively. And so there, there are a lot of laws, there are rights, there is a lot of resource out there for tenants to, to protect themselves, to insist on having livable units, to, to make sure that their landlord respects their privacy, to not be you know, wrongfully evicted. But it's really, really hard to get those things respected and to enforce them unless the tenant is informed and you know, savvy enough to navigate those systems and has the time and energy to force landlords to respect their rights if they are being mistreated. And that's something that tenants really often don't have the time to do. Uh, so our group exists really to connect with tenants. We do a lot of outreach to try to help them and 
enforce their rights and make sure that they are not mistreated or abused. Um, we try to connect them to resources, uh, you know, rental assistance programs, legal counsel that can help them. And you know, ultimately our goal is to get tenants to organize themselves, to talk to other tenants, talk to people in their buildings and really you know, build up from there. So the, the best example I can give, I think, of why housing regulation is so tough is the recent eviction moratorium. It's actually, it's gonna expire in a couple of days, I believe at the end of June, they have not extended it. But during the pandemic last year, um, the CDC put out a statement and put a moratorium on evictions. And so anyone who was behind on rent and who could uh, prove that they lost income or that they, they were losing money because of the pandemic could not be evicted. And that was a national moratorium. So after that, nobody got evicted for not paying their rent, right? No, actually, absolutely not. Evictions kept going through. Landlords kept filing the paperwork and uh, multiple people have been evicted even in our community, despite the fact that it should not be happening according to the CDC. Um, and the problem with this is the moratorium didn't just automatically take effect. For a tenant to use the moratorium, they would have to first hear about it, which um, based on the outreach we have done is pretty unlikely. It did not get super widespread. Um, after they heard about it, they'd have to probably do some research and look it up and figure out how to apply it. And so they would have to print off a statement form saying that they were behind on their rent, that they had nowhere else to go and they couldn't find another housing unit, that they had pursued every avenue um, to get any kind of rental assistance to keep, help them catch up with their rent, and that um, they would take on the full responsibility of all missed rent whenever the moratorium expired. They would have to sign that, they would have to deliver it to their landlord to make a statement that they're using the moratorium, and then finally, they would be protected against being evicted. So you can imagine it did not work super well for a lot of people. Um, through our outreach, we fortunately got people to use it, but it's just not an intuitive process. You can see that the tenant really has a ton of responsibility to try to apply this. And when you are already faced with an eviction, that's really one of the last times you need to learn to navigate a whole new system and go through a bunch of bureaucratic paperwork. So. Uh, just to go further into the struggles of tenants and my wife insisted I use this picture from the cartoon, so I hope someone appreciates it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, tenants have it really tough. Um, they have the responsibility for all damages. They have the responsibility to put security deposits up. And in the state of Wisconsin, there's no limit on security deposits. So landlords can charge whatever they want. And that is a state level law. Um, they're also in charge of documenting their moving in and moving out status of their apartment uh, to, to keep track of damages. And, you know, just to, just to, illuminate the balance of power and how tenants have a lot of responsibility. You know, we could have a system in which there isn't a security deposit and the landlord would have to pursue the tenant for damages after move out. But instead, it's on the tenant to have to file court paperwork, pay the court fees, and start a case to try to pursue their security deposit if it's wrongfully withheld or if they don't think the damages were caused by them. And, you know, in, in addition with documentation and move in and move out, um, it really makes a lot more sense to me to have the landlord document the unit before the person moves in and then provide that to the tenant. That way we would know, you know, the tenant is just moving in. They're not familiar with the place. They're getting used to a new location. The landlord should be familiar with the unit and have months or years or decades of experience with it. And so uh, we could easily shift the responsibility in a lot of the systems that we kind of take for granted as the way that renting and tenancy works. Um, but that's probably not gonna happen at the city or county level. So we won't really focus on those solutions today. And you know, just to give a little more background too, um, securitydepositrefund.org is an organization that works to try to get people their security deposits back. Um, a 2017 estimate, they had about $463 million in security deposit theft. So we're talking about you know, magnitude hundreds of millions of dollars a year coming out of tenants' pockets um, for things they really didn't do. And it's tough to get perfect statistics on that. It's a lot of he said, he said she said with, what was and wasn't damaged and you know what's wear and tear, what's acceptable use and what's not. But you know, it's still um, it's estimated about $1.5 billion is held in security deposits. So you can imagine, especially looking at the rental markets with you know the growing income inequality and our, our growing low income and poverty level subsistence living people, um, that's a huge amount of assets to be sitting in the landlord's bank account, um, probably earning them interest in money until they return it or try not to return it. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, like we said, the low vacancy rate also um, really allows tenants to be very picky with who they allow to come and rent from them. And um, as Kevin stated, they discriminate on a lot of things, you know, all the classic discriminatory practices, age, race, 
gender, you know, who you voted for last election, whatever they whatever they want to really, because it's it's incredibly difficult to actually prove a discrimination case when you have no unless the tenant, um, you know, hears the landlord outright say something specific about why they're not renting from them, which typically they're not sending out, you know, you just get a rejection slip. But the, the unique part of renting is the eviction record discrimination, which again, when we have such a low vacancy rate, um, landlords often screen for eviction or run background checks. And if you have an eviction pop up, um, they will turn you down because they think it's a risk. Um, and so eviction records for our state are actually open records. So you can look up anyone's history of evictions. Um, it's all open on the court website, CCAP. And uh, really if the, the dastardly part of this too is if you get an eviction filed against you, even if you don't get evicted and it's settled out of court or it's pulled back, you still have an eviction record. Um, you can still pull up the CCAP record that someone filed an eviction against you. Um, and even if you didn't get evicted, you know, the landlord's probably not pouring through the court records to see the judgment and exactly what went on. They're probably just seeing your record and crossing it off. And again, this is another example of, you could technically get those records cleared. Um, I've been told you can, I've never actually seen someone successfully go through the process because uh, the only person that can do it is a judge. So you have to insist that the case go all the way to the court. And at the court, you have to ask the judge to seal or expunge your record. And you have to get the landlord to consent that they can do that is the way it was explained to me. So, you, you know, again, not, not a right or a system that is built to actually be used effectively by people. Um, and Wisconsin laws really just favor landlords. Um, you know, there's no just cause for eviction and non-renewal. So if your lease is up, your landlord can just say, hey, you know what, I've decided you don't live here anymore. And that's it. They don't have to give you any more than the 30-day notice that they're not gonna renew your lease. Um, again, security deposit limits, they can be 10 months of rent. They can be whatever landlords want. Raising rent, there's not, no limit as far as once your lease ends and a new one starts. They can raise your rent as high as they want. Um, recently in La Crosse, there was a, I think this was a year or two ago, there was a repeal on some fire inspection laws and people were really upset with the city for it. But it was actually because the state had passed preemption laws, again, that um, made it essentially illegal for the city to require landlords to have more thorough fire inspection. And so there were just a huge host of preemption laws passed under Scott Walker back in 2011. And, um, there's not a ton we can do to really force landlords to a higher standard, unfortunately, as far as local and, and county laws go. And so if we're looking at a struggle between landlords and tenants, and we really can't stop the landlords, our other option is to really empower and lift up the tenants, help them enforce their rights and give them more ammunition. So what have we done so far uh, with Cooley Tenants United? We started off doing some door knocking in 2019. Um, we have a Facebook page, we have an email, we have an outreach phone number so people can reach out to us and talk to us about their renting troubles. Um, you know, we started off looking at landlords that people had reached out to us about. So, you know, the, the most notorious so far is certainly Nate Brooks and River City Rentals. Um, he's responsible for one in four evictions since we started tracking eviction numbers. Um, and we've heard a lot of complaints about repairs on his units. So we started off trying to help people get those repairs done, talk to them about what issues they're seeing. but. Um, of course, COVID hit and we couldn't go door to door and talk to a bunch of strangers. Um, so we kind of used the, the the unfortunate reality of eviction records being open court records to our advantage and started sending out a mailer. We just pulled the eviction data every day, their name and their addresses on there. So we mailed out a mailer out telling them about, you know, our group existing and that we saw their eviction. And, um, you know, we'd love to help them out, talk to them about resources, connect them to rental assistance programs if they qualify, legal counsel, and, you know, really just talk them through the process. Um, a lot of the work we've done isn't even really any aha moment or, or a big gotcha as far as what solves their issues. It's more about helping them be empowered to, to exercise their own rights, understand the civil court system and what steps they're going to have to walk through to contest their eviction, and even just understand what's filed. Um, you know, landlords can put very threatening paperwork up on your door. They can say, you know, in huge red font, you you are notified to vacate immediately, and then in really tiny font at the bottom, like immediately unless you move the people from your front lawn to your back lawn in the next 48 hours, you know, and that means nothing. Only the sheriff can actually kick you out and only the judge can make a decision that that is going to happen. So, you know, really helping them not feel intimidated, trying to shift that balance of power back. Um, but, you know, everything we've been doing so far, um, we've done a lot of great work. We've done a lot of harm reduction. It feels like we're really helping people out. We sent out over 140 mailers since we started tracking back in October. Um, we've had close to 100 cases reach out to us 
Uh, we've definitely kept some people in their homes, helped people catch up on bills and get connected to rental assistance and avoid eviction and, you know, save thousands of dollars in security deposits not being wrongfully withheld. But, you know, we, we really wanted to identify looking forward, what kind of progress can we make? What kind of, you know, systemic solutions can we find to actually prevent these problems before they happen or to systematize some kind of way to, you know, treat this without you know, frankly, volunteers that aren't professionals in this field having to go and fill in those gaps. So we really still see big opportunity for, you know, some kind of professionalized institutional advocacy. Um, you know, it could be city, it could be the county, it could be the nonprofits. Um, Boulder, Colorado established a city committee, for example, for renters, um, along with a bill they passed. And Lori will talk more about um, some other options there next. But, um, you know, one big solution, um, that we are heavily advocating for is establishing a right to counsel for eviction for La Crosse County. Um, I think it's pretty intuitive. Uh, you know, you have a right to counsel in criminal court if you are charged with a crime and your freedom is on the line. I, th I think, you know, everyone across the political spectrum agrees you should have legal counsel. I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone advocate against the, the Gideon v. Wainwright decision to provide people with lawyers if they can't afford one. Um, but it's not extended to civil court at all. And you know the stakes are really high in civil court. You can lose your housing. You, know, you could lose your kids in custody battles. Um, you know, if you do lose your housing, you might lose your job. You might lose your ability to take public transport. And you know, there are so many disruptive effects that you know, cause knockdown effects, kids moving school districts, losing access to nutrition, not knowing where to get groceries, or ending up in a food desert, disconnected from your community. So eviction is, is a very traumatic experience, especially if you don't have time to effectively plan and move out even if you ultimately don't end up being able to stay and you know just a quick stat from philadelphia studied um landlord and tenant representation they found 81 percent of landlords already have lawyers and only eight percent of tenants have legal counsel um and you know it's pretty intuitive too a landlord is a professional they probably have a lawyer on retainer they probably work with lawyers to set up their business and they've been to eviction court before landlords evict people regularly it's a part of the job and so you know they've been through it they know what the court case looks like they know what the system is like they know what day is best to file them and they know where they're going to ask to help them out if the case gets complicated you know alternatively does, does anyone here if you got an eviction notice would you have a lawyer that you know you're going to call right away probably not you know and once you get that it really puts you into a high stress situation where you're just not well equipped to dig through legal laws and you're probably thinking about should i move out should i find a new place now how do you know if you should sign a new lease if you haven't found out if you're evicted from your old place? So it's really just a chaotic time and you know it, it requires professional counsel. So um, is, this, is this achievable? Absolutely. Um, this is not reinventing the wheel. Um, you know, I, <laughs> a lot of the solutions we're looking at here are just pulling, pulling projects from other places that have already successfully been implemented and been shown to work and you know, bringing them to lacrosse. So we don't really have to reinvent the wheel here. Um, Connecticut, Maryland, and Washington all have passed bills at the state level to give counsel to people in eviction cases. Um, in addition, New York City, San Francisco, Rochester, New York, Baltimore, Boulder, Colorado um, have all passed comprehensive full coverage right to counsel at the city level. Um, and you know there are several other towns that have done some amount of coverage, Louisville, Kentucky, Cleveland, Ohio, Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, they all have programs for eviction right to counsel, typically tied to some income level or tied to if there are children in the home, um, you know, kind of tailored to their communities a little more. But we would really push for, you know, full spectrum, cover everybody, and, um, you know, people will kind of naturally self-select out. The programs that have done that have seen a lot of success. And actually, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at the county level, has just introduced recently in the past month or two a right to counsel proposal to fund it from stimulus funds. So. Um, yeah, uh, when you pass right to counsel, it saves money, it saves people's lives, it saves people's health, it helps build the community up, and it prevents homelessness. You know, we talked so much about homelessness last week and how hard it is to get people out of homelessness and, you know, how, how comprehensive we have to make those programs to really lift people up when they've got all those compounding knockdown effects and all those, you know, traumas and problems kind of add up. And so, you know, we really need to prevent it beforehand. Um, so does right to counsel work? Yes, absolutely. Milwaukee has a, kind of a precursor to right to counsel, the eviction defense project. It's connecting tenants to pro bono lawyers 
And there are some legal staff that do the connecting and help with some of the basic work, but they showed already, you know, every dollar they spend on the eviction defense project returns $2 and 23 cents on the investment. So, you know, yes, it does cost money, but much like last week when we talked about bringing in more section eight vouchers and how the housing authority uh, loses money bringing section eight in because HUD doesn't pay for the administrative costs. Well, here too, you know, we, we are going to spend money to fund a program like this to give them counsel, but, you know, decreased shelter use, decreased police contact, decreased need for homelessness services, and, you know, building up a sustainable community, keeping people in their homes, keeping people in their jobs, keeping the school system, you know, running smoothly, all of that pays dividends uh, significantly. And, you know, the eviction defense project in Milwaukee shows 90% of tenants represented had their cases delayed or dismissed. So that's a huge amount of success. Again, even if they don't get dismissed, just delaying that case, uh, even a couple of weeks to allow people to really actually plan an exit strategy and figure out where they're going um, can make all the difference in a catastrophic eviction that's totally disruptive and a smooth move to another location. So uh, just to pull some more statistics on why right to council works in the real world, New York City is the first city that passed it back in 2017 and their statistics are really staggering. So you, know, you can see right here, these are statistics comparing 2013 to 2019. Tenant representation in civil court went from 1% to 38% at six years. Evictions have dropped by 41%. You know, that's huge. Um, lacrosse sees something like three to 400 evictions a year uh, based on the past 10 years of data. And so, you know, that would, be, that would be close to half of those. That would be 160 cases off the docket. Um, and, you know, 15% of that alone was in 2019. And eviction filings dropped from 30 to 20. In 20, uh, thir from 30%, 2013 to 2019, and 20% alone in 2019. And so we can see, you know, the right to counsel itself is discouraging landlords from filing cases. Um, when they know there's gonna be a lawyer, when they know whatever they decide to, you know, file a frivolous eviction or file one that they think probably won't stand up, but they think the tenant might just leave, they know a lawyer is going to be on the other end and throw it out of court. They're not gonna waste the $200 to file the paperwork. Uh, you know, it's a waste of time. And that's where more money saving is too, not clogging the courts up with extra eviction cases. You know, judges and public uh, servants, their time is valuable. And, you know, that saves a lot of money. Um, and they showed, you know, 84% of the represented tenants in New York got to stay in the housing they were in. So if you look at 84% of that 38% that was represented, that's over 30% of the people who have evictions filed against them get to stay in their house. So, um, and again, you can see it's, it saved them a ton of money. They got an independent study done to compare and really have a, an impartial group judge the program. And they showed $320 million is saved by the program. And it's only costing something like 120 to $130 million a year. So, you know, in summary, it, it very clearly works. It's, it's a net gain in money. It makes our community more sustainable. Hence the uses. It keeps people in home and it prevents homelessness. So it's really, it's an investment in human capital too to help people build up a better life for themselves. And, um, you know, comparing caseload from New York City to La Crosse, um, we'd probably be looking at like $150,000 to $200,000 a year if every single court case used the services. Um, we know that won't be the case, and we know the cost should ultimately drop over time as cases are used less and less as the evictions drop and the eviction filings drop. But, um, yeah, and uh, we got a note here from Maureen Friedland from the county board. She is, says she is hoping for a proposal to come through on the La Crosse County Board. So everybody stay tuned for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lori Logan, our last speaker for the night, to talk about more solutions to the struggles tenants face. Yes, that looks great. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, my name is Lori Logan. I'm a family physician here in La Crosse. And um, since I, I have an occupational hazard and that sometimes I say the word patient when I mean the word tenant. So sorry about that. This really is about tenants, not about patients. Um, although there's some, there really are, a lot of it is really the same um, since uh, the same things that affect tenants um, do affect people's health also. Um, so, and, you know, and how, housing affects health. That's absolutely for sure. Um, okay, here... I think we can. I think we can cope with the fact that the slides. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, keys to preventing eviction: safe housing, paid rent, happy tenant, happy landlord, fewer homeless people. Uh, next slide. 
So, um, so sometimes one of the issues is landlord tenant communication about safety and repairs. So as Peter alluded to, um, not landlords don't always follow up on verbal requests and agreements. I think Kevin talked a little bit about this too. Um, another aspect of this is that tenants may not have experience with making their requests and agreements in writing. So one thing that would be helpful for is for tenants to have tools to submit their requests in writing. And that would facilitate landlords getting, understanding what needed to be done. And then would also allow the tenant to have documentation that there really was in fact a request submitted. Um, so this is, a, this is a need, this is something that could be improved upon uh, in our area. Um, next slide. So, um, so needed tenant resources, under tenants understanding what they can expect from a landlord, tenants understanding what their responsibilities are, understanding how to communicate with a landlord, and as Peter also talked about, knowing what to do if the landlord isn't following through. Tenants really don't, many tenants do not know what their, res what resources they have, what the law um, permits a landlord to do. Um, Next slide. So there often do come up issues where tenants have made requests that really are safety issues, um, issues where there is not adequate plumbing, issues where there is not, where the building is not able to be heated to be warm enough, um, holes in the walls, dangers, infestations, lots of things that a landlord maybe has not fulfilled um, their responsibility to a tenant. And so when tenants, when landlords are not fulfilling their requests, next slide. The uh, next issue is getting the building inspected. Currently there is a city, an inspection system, but the only way to request an inspection is during, is by phone during office hours. Um, and um, so the request has to be made during office hours by phone and the inspection itself is only available from nine to 4.30 Monday through Friday. So if you're working a basic nine to five job, you don't have, a, you have to take a day off in order to get your housing inspected. So next slide. Some improvements that could take place would be to have more ways to request inspection. So for instance, on a website, an email, and then to provide times that inspections could be done such as week, weekends or evenings that people could have inspection done without, um, without having to take a day off work. Uh, next slide. So eviction prevention. So besides safe housing, what about rental assistance? What a, that you know? One big reason for eviction is people aren't able to pay their rent. Um, next slide. So WERA is the Wisconsin Emergency Rental Assistance Program. This was a COVID relief program. It's administered by Cooley Cap, provides assistance with rent and utilities for renters who are earning less than 80% of the county median and their income is affected by the pandemic. Next slide. And so this has been a really successful program. 686 households uh, in four counties have been assisted by the program. Um, and this is really just the second uh, COVID relief rental assistance program that's been established. And so then you really think about what if this program hadn't been there? Where would these 686 households be if they hadn't been able to rely on an emergency rental assistance program? Um, so certainly one can imagine that there would really be a big increase in homelessness. Um, but this program ends December 31st. And I don't really anticipate that there's going to be a need, even though things are changing with the pandemic, um, it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be an end to the need for rental assistance. So next slide. So the future is, could we offer as a city, could we fund a rental assistance program? Um, and this isn't Crazy, as Peter mentioned before, this we aren't reinventing the wheel. Um, there are other cities that offer this, and there's a pretty diverse range of cities, everything from Boulder, Colorado to Jacksonville, Florida. New York City has a big program. Um, Phoenix, Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, smaller cities have this too. So this certainly is something that we could 
uh, think about investing in. Next slide. Uh, more ideas. Um, Madison has a tenant resource center and this, uh, this, the tenant resource center has been helping tenants for 40 years. Um, at one point in time, it was able to serve all of Wisconsin, but budget cuts happened, services became more limited, and now are only limited to Dane County. Um, it's funded by the city, the county, and by grants. So um, I'm gonna tell you more about what the program, well, all the things that they offer, because it really is pretty nice. And it's a lot that we could offer to um, our La Crosse County and La Crosse City residents. Um, next slide. So some of the things they offer are landlord and tenant education, tenant resources, landlord resources, pre-eviction mediation, and then referrals for tenants that need more help. Next slide. Um, so landlord and tenant education, um, they do offer classes and seminars. Um, so they can offer these for, you know, the tenants can even sort of be certified saying that they've attended one of these classes, um, as can tenants. So if tenants are wanting to, um, you know, maybe get another credential that they, um, from a uh, the saying that they are sort of approved or they understand what their responsibilities are. They can say that they've attended a class. Um, and then there also is printed and web-based information um, for both tenants and landlords to understand what the law is and um, what their rights are. Uh, next slide. So some tenant resources mm -hmm. are things like sample letters. So sample letter requesting a security deposit back, sample letter for repairs. Um, also, they have a nice resource on how to write a letter, um, including things like, don't put anything in the letter that you wouldn't want repeated in court. So it's, it's kind of nice because you know a lot, a lot of tenants maybe have not thought about exactly how they would put how they would put in writing what their problem is. And then it also gets written in a written documentation of their concern that they can prove later if something does go to court. Um, things like they've, even things that are outside of the tenant landlord relationships like roommate agreements are also things that are available through the Tenant Resource Center. Um, next slide. Uh, landlord resources, so sample leases, sample security deposit agreements, um, sample check-in and check-out, which is both a landlord and a tenant resource, um, but it sort of gets things on a nice, even footing um, for when um, to sort of prevent disputes and have things following the law before things even get started. Um, next slide. Pre-eviction mediation is another nice thing that's done with the Tenant Resource Center. So counselors can work with the tenant and the landlord before an eviction is filed, help come up with a workable plan. And then afterwards, they can also help tenants with sticking with whatever that plan is for a three month period after the date that the tenant and landlord have agreed on the plan. So this would be so awesome. It would just keep these cases out of the court system, keep eviction filings off of tenants records, but still meet the same goal that in the end is easier for the landlord to keep someone in a, uh, a unit rather than have it cycling through with one tenant after another. Um, next slide. Uh, they also do referrals such as then uh, emergency rental assistance because there are a variety of programs that are in existence um, through nonprofits and some other government agencies and that they could also help refer patients for, or there I go again, tenants. They could refer tenants for this. Um, and then if tenants do become homeless to help them with other housing resources. Next slide. So keys to preventing homelessness are a lot of things we talked about today. So improving the inspection system, doing something to continue emergency rental assistance, guarantee right to counsel, help to fund a tenant resource center, expand Section 8 housing, offer a Section 8 damages fund. Zoning reform, we didn't talk, we didn't talk about zoning reform. Um, I think Jason did maybe, oh, you know, Jason did a little bit. So zoning reform is something uh, still also in the city's control. 
Um, investing in public housing is really a big one, um, but that would really alleviate a lot of this. Um, and then as Julie talked about a week ago, adopting the strategic plan. So all of these things are things that government can affect. And they are things that are going to prevent homelessness, but they're also really going to, uh, going to help out that 50% of La Crosse residents who are, um, next slide, I think I have this on my next one. Um, so who are in this Alice category, this asset limited, income constrained, employed, you know, these are gonna help people that didn't even know they were at risk of homelessness. And it's gonna just improve their quality of life regardless of whether it was um, at what we've talked about, even if they weren't going to become homeless, but if they lost their security deposit because the landlord didn't wanna give it back and didn't really have a good reason and they didn't know they had a right a way to get it back. Um, it, I mean, think about it, 50% of our lacrosse population fits into that category and would really benefit from a lot of these programs. Um, and then in the big picture, as Julie talked about last week, when you look at the cost of homelessness, what's the cost of someone spending a week in Cameron Park? What's the cost to the lacrosse institutions? So the other institutions, the people with higher incomes, they lose too when someone becomes homeless. Um, so there's, uh, there are things that we can do, and it really benefits all of us in lacrosse. Next slide. So I challenge everyone to do what they can if you're in a position to make decisions that, um, on, that affect the city, do it. If you're in a position to talk to your uh, city council member, your county board supervisor, let them know that these are things you wanna have happen. And that's all. Okay, yeah, thank you, Laurie. Wow, I got a lot darker in my kitchen. <laughs> but yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate you sticking it out with us, especially with our extra 20 minutes here. But if people want to stick around for Q&A, um, you know, I'm happy to stay. I don't know if everyone can, but uh, we're way over time, but you know, there's no room to close down. So I guess you can fire away if you have any questions or throw something in the chat. <laughs>